Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. This device might look like an oscilloscope, but it isn't. It is an arbitrary waveform generator. The BNCs on the front are actually outputs instead of inputs. It probably does not take much to realize that there is a price performance difference between this 5 MHz function generator and a 160 MHz arbitrary waveform generator. The Element 14 community sent me this unit so that we can see how well it performs and help you understand when you might well use one of these versus one of these. If you want to follow along, use the link below to the Element 14 community to download the datasheet for the MP750290. With that, let's go review. Now, technically, I covered arbitrary waveform generators, or ARBs, in the episode on function generator basics. Check for a link in the notes if you missed that one. At their cores, these two instruments are the same. The different wave shapes on the function generator are all digitally generated. The difference is their performance and usability. The MP750290, or as I'll call it for the rest of this video, the 290 has a large 8-inch touchscreen, two output channels, 160 megahertz of bandwidth, a 14-bit digital to analog converter running at 1.25 giga samples per second, which is fed from a 1 million point waveform memory and built-in tools to modify the waveform. More on those at the end. Channels one and two are clearly identified. Moving through the built-in functions works just like a traditional function generator. There are preview graphics for each wave shape, even on the arbitrary modes, so that you know what to expect on the output. Also notice it shows the upper and lower voltage limits. This clear graphic helps eliminate the common mistake of setting negative output voltages. Entering values is very intuitive. Type in the numbers and then select the units. Either the keypad or the touchscreen work the same. The three modifier modes, modulation, sweep, and burst are just as straightforward. This generator has a large number of modulations available, but I'm not going to cover them in this video. What I will mention is the sheer number of built-in arbitrary waveforms. I'm not listing them all because as you can see here, there's a bunch, over 150. Overall, the usability of basic functions is very high, but I doubt most people would purchase an ARB in the $1,000 range just because of that. So let's go take a look at its performance aspects. Using the data sheet, let's evaluate a few specifications, starting with the 160 megahertz on the banner. Here the generator is set up for a sine wave at 160 megahertz and the scope agrees. When I go to a square wave, it drops to 50 megahertz. This is typical for an AWG. Arbitrary does 15 megahertz for built-in waveforms and 50 megahertz for user loaded. But the weird one is ramp. It's limited to only five megahertz for some reason. Now these are all clearly spelled out in the data sheet. Next, I set the ARB to a square wave with three frequencies, 5 kHz, 5 MHz, and 50 MHz. Here are all of their overlaid scope captures. Notice at the max, there is a bit more noise and the frequency isn't quite as stable. But even at max frequency, the deviation is relatively small. Deviation is also known as jitter, which gets specified in seconds, not hertz. The scope I use day to day does not have any automated jitter measurements. One technique we can use is to turn on infinite persistence, move away from the trigger point, and then let the scope run for a bit. After a while, horizontal and vertical cursors can measure the variation or jitter of the edge. With the generator set at 50 megahertz, I'm measuring 380 picoseconds. Anything less than 500 picoseconds in this price class is decent. By the way, if you look at the data sheet, it specifies 300 picoseconds RMS for a square wave. But our method is actually peak to peak, which means the RMS value is going to be less. To verify the rise time performance, I slow the generator down to one kilohertz since rep rate is less important. The mean rise time is just below spec with the max just slightly hitting over five nanoseconds. Maybe that's from the BNC cable. Next, let's evaluate voltage resolution and accuracy. For a DC output, you load a built-in arbitrary waveform. First, we measure the noise floor of the scope when the generator is set to zero volts. Setting the generator to one millivolt moved the waveform to about one millivolts on the scope. Two millivolts goes to two, and so on. So the precision of setting the output looks right. Next, let's look at accuracy. 
On the scope setup, it stays at one millivolt per division, but now I add a one volt offset to the channel so that I can change the generator's output to 1.000 volts. Now we want to pay attention to which grids the waveform is in. The DC value is around the one millivolt grid on the scope. When I bump up the generator by one millivolt, notice how the waveform jumps between 1.003 and 1.004. Adding another millivolt makes the waveform go between the three and four millivolt divisions. So what does this mean? Remember resolution and accuracy are different, but related. So the generator has a one millivolt resolution, but its accuracy is 1% of the setting plus one millivolt peak to peak. That's why we saw a difference with the one volt offset. But do I consider this good or bad? I'd say for this class of instrument, it's fine. You can probably get a usable 10 millivolt accuracy across the 20 volt output range. Now let's take a look at some frequency performance using a spectrum analyzer. Here I centered at one megahertz with a cursor snapped to the peak showing 1.003 megahertz at almost zero dBm. But we can do better than that by setting the resolution bandwidth to its minimum of one hertz and a short span like 48 hertz. After we speed up the sweep, we can see that the spec and sees one hertz more than expected. Checking the generator's data sheet, it says its frequency accuracy is one part per million, which is like 100 hertz at a megahertz. So well within spec and better than I expected. Since these waveforms are generated from a digital system, there are going to be spurs throughout the frequency domain. With the digital to analog converter running at 1.25 giga samples per second, we can see a small signal there. It's actually being filtered pretty well. Interestingly, there is a pretty strong harmonic at 2.5 gigahertz. It's nothing to worry about. I just thought it was interesting. By the way, if you need a tutorial on spectrum analyzers, we did an instrument basics episode on them. Check the notes for a link to that. Looking at the more reasonable range of 200 megahertz and down with a zero dBm signal in, you can see almost no spurs through 70 dB and is pretty much what I expected to see. So let's zoom in to see some detail. Here we can see the generator output is still set to one megahertz. We can also see the harmonics from that signal, which are typical for a digitally synthesized sine wave. Regarding total harmonic distortion, or THD, for one megahertz, I measured 1%. But the data sheet specifies from 10 hertz to 20 kilohertz that it should be less than 0.05%. So repeating with a 10 kilohertz carrier, the analyzer measures 0.2%, which is pretty high. And I'm not positive, but shouldn't the markers be at the peaks? If I calculate there, I get something like 16%. One thought I had is that 10 kilohertz is pretty low for this spectrum analyzer, even though it's specified to go to five kilohertz. Also, would you get a 160 megahertz AWG for audio? Now, admittedly, it's been years since I measured THD, so maybe I did it wrong. If you have an idea, please let me know over on the Element 14 community because I'd be happy to repeat the measurement. For now, let's talk usability. To me, a big feature of the 290 is its 1 million point waveform memory. Now, one way to use it is the built-in editor, which can only work with 100,000 points. Inside the editor, you can actually see why. You first select the point and then the voltage for that point and repeat and again and again and again and again. Now, there are some touch controls that kind of work too. One is an arbitrary drawing tool, which works okay, I guess. The other makes clean levels, but neither of these are what I would call precise. That said, I can hit data to channel and see this crazy waveform on a scope. And then you can change the frequency and amplitude just like the built-in functions. If you don't want to create your own waveform from scratch, you can start with one of the many built-in waveforms and modify those. From my experience using the 290, when I modified the wave shapes, I always kept the number of points to 100 or less to make it easier to modify them. <sighs> so this is where I have a big negative with the 290. The editing is awkward. It's not impossible, just awkward. But here's the worst part. You can't save, load, and then re-edit the waveform again. For example, I can save this modified Weibull shape into user six and then I preset the analyzer to reset the memories. Now I can load or <clears throat> call out user six into a channel. Let's say you want to change one of those peaks. When you go back into the editor, the waveform defaults back to a template. I looked everywhere, but could not find a way to re-edit the waveform. 
I thought maybe you had to load it while in the editor, but nope. That just loads a ramp instead, every single time. This issue made me think, maybe the PC software helps. Spoiler, it does not. The software you need is called DSWave, or Waveform Editor. It is Windows only and connects to the generator with USB or Ethernet. It can also export binary files for the generator. As you can see, the software is rather <clears throat> basic. It has drawing controls similar to the built-in waveform editor, but like that one, there is absolutely no precision. Frankly, I couldn't figure out how the built-in editor or that software is very useful. Neither are a good option for making use of the full waveform memory. But I have this scenario in my mind where I capture a waveform from an oscilloscope that I want to generate with the ARB. So, with some help, I put together a Python script that converts CSV files from a scope or any tool that you can use to generate voltage points into the binary file format that the software and the ARB needs. With that, I can load the waveform into the generator from a USB drive and re-output it to the scope. By the way, this is a video waveform I captured from an upcoming project. Also, the script works great up to 1 million points, even though I'm not using all of those in this example. And then last, I will warn you that my very first approach was to program the waveform memory with remote skippy commands, but not all of the commands in the manual work. So make sure you test them before you write an entire script around them. So do I recommend the MP750290 or its related generators with different bandwidths? Well, provisionally. As a basic function generator with high performance outputs, I'm happy with its capability. Overall, the analog performance is commensurate for an instrument of this class. I really wish there was usable software to help make working with the arbitrary waveforms easier. But now that I've got that Python script, I can create the binaries myself. So I'm happy to use MATLAB or something else. On the Element 14 community, you can find show notes for this episode. There, I will try to post any updates I learn about this line of generators, the scripts that I wrote to help make them usable, and of course, there are links to the products themselves. Remember, if you have questions, that is the best place to ask me because I check there every day. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to transforming digital codes into voltages using a custom Python script on my electronics workbench.